There we go. Hey, greetings and salutations, everyone. Thank you for tuning in once again to On Air with Walt. I am your host, Walt Lusk, and you are not going to believe the guest we have today. From Toronto, Canada, we have Mark S. Berry, who is the founder and CEO and chairman of AMG, which is in a huge conglomerate regarding television, music, and film. And uh, Mark is a fabulous guy, started his career almost 5 zero, 50 years ago. So without any further ado, hey, Mark, mm -hmm. thanks, for, hey, buddy. thanks for being on air with Walt. Absolutely. By the way, it's, it's Toronto via Brooklyn. Yes, well, I understand that. We're gonna we're gonna talk about your gallivanting because I know you you started in Brooklyn, then you went to New York, then you went to London. So, oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you're you're yeah. you've uh, tr you've been a globe trotter for a long time. Yeah. Now you also did some stuff in Australia. Did you make it down there? You did some stuff for some Australian guys. Yeah, you know my attorney Paul Schindler, uh, uh, a world renowned attorney, still my attorney to this day, introduced me to a very a uh, famous Australian entrepreneur named Michael Godinsky. And Michael mm -hmm. had Mushroom Records. Mushroom Records. And he, he signed, uh, and he had Frontier Touring, so he brought in all the major major acts. And then uh, he had uh, Mushroom Music, which uh, uh, had Jimmy Barnes, who's like the Bruce Springsteen of Australia, and um, who I worked with as well. And um, and I went down there to do a record uh, called Kids in the Kitchen. And... Uh, like an alternative rock record, and it did really, really well. Uh, got it signed. Seymour Stein at Sire Records signed it back in North America, and um, and then I started going back and forth uh, down to Australia. This was like in the mid mid eighties, uh, in the mid to late eighties. I had just left Vanguard uh, uh, Records, and uh, you know I did work on the Pseudo Echo record. They had Funky Town and things oh. like that. So yeah, going you know, down under. Now, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you started in Massachusetts, and then you went to uh, New York, and then you finished high school and decided to venture to London, if I recall. And yeah, you, so, uh, you, you love the, so the British vibe. Hampton. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I wrote down all of the studios that I wanted to, uh, whose door I wanted to knock on off my favorite records. Elton John, T-Rex, you know, all these records what studios they worked at. And I just, um, you know, it was that the Vietnam war was going on and, you know, every night we'd go downstairs after dinner in the den, Walter Cronkite, the most trusted name in news. In and, news. And, 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 you know, I turned to mom and dad, mom, dad, they're going to grab me without a doubt. Ah, uh, yes. In terms of the, yeah, the draft. You, you so, were, you were of age. I was of age. Yeah. My brother, my older brother, David, he joined the Navy. And uh, he was safe in the, in the middle of the South Pacific on some some boat, so uh, he was pretty safe. Uh, but uh, so I said, "Yes, yeah, when I was around 16." So I uh, they said, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "Well, you know, I like music. My dad used to bring records home all the time, and, and I would always listen to him." And it's like, you know, how come the drums are coming out of that speaker and uh, the guitars are coming out of that speaker? <laughs> there, you, there you go. And my, and my dad's like, "I don't know. Go find out." <laughs> So, uh, so I, I went and found out. I, I went to the uh, my junior and senior year in New York. I went to the uh, in, in Manhattan. I went to the Institute of Audio Research um, in Lower Manhattan uh, by NYU, and um, and I did two years there with with some some of the legends in the technical recording. John Warham, who wrote the Engineer's Handbook, uh, wow. uh, Irv Deal, uh, uh, a stunning you know classy engineer. Uh, so you know we had great uh, we had great teachers and uh, and then I did that for my junior and senior year in Manhattan going into school you know after my regular school going into Manhattan at night right uh, you're driving in at night uh, after going to school all day that's I'm 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 training it in at night I'm on the subway so yeah well as it says on your email at the bottom of it mm -hmm. no rich parents no handouts. No favors, straight hustle all day, every day. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so what it takes. That's, I mean, from day takes, one. You know? Yeah, I just started, you know, in England. I just, that's what I did. I just wrote all these studio names down that, that were off, you know, the Led Zeppelin album, the Elton John album. You know, it's like, you know, um, and I just pounded on doors. And uh, I was just the luckiest kid in the world, you know, to start with uh, air studios and the way i got in there was just go like a complete accident i uh 
you know, I went up there, the, uh, you know, the studio manager wasn't there. So they said, come back the next day. I go back the next day. The uh, receptionist is not in the lobby of the uh, entrance to the studio way. And out comes this assistant engineer, hair down the middle of his back, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, who are you? You know, I'm, I'm Mark Berry from Brooklyn. You know, you know, I'm cool, you know. He goes, you're from New York? Yeah, 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 I'm from New York. Come on in, come on in. So uh, I walked down this hallway, and I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. I actually got past the front door. Yes. And, uh, and uh, I, I sat in on a, a session with a singer named Alan Clark, who was the lead singer for a band called The Hollies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they had a record called uh, Long Cool Woman, um, which was a monster, and Al, uh, Alan uh, Clark was off doing his own his own record, and and you know D Murray, who was the bass player for Elton John, he mm -hmm. was playing bass on it, and Brinsley Schwartz was playing drums, and you know I'm sitting there, oh my god, and I'm just sitting there like, you know, and then I uh, I uh, somebody said, you know, you want to uh, give me a cigarette? So I'm going out for smoke. I, I smoked at the time, and he goes, uh, so I'd get cigarettes for people, and then you know, and then I I asked. Uh, 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 the engineer, uh, John Punter, I said, can I, you mind if I come back, you know, tomorrow? And he said, no, no, come on back, come on back, yeah. So I kept coming back, and then I kept coming back. I kept coming back. And, <laughs> you know, kept, kept coming back. There you, you go. Know, cool. I mean? I, shoot, I would. I mean, I have a real good friend of mine named Ron Payne who did some recording at uh, The Village, which is a great place. I don't know if you're familiar with it in Santa Monica. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Elton John was two doors down, and anybody who's anybody had recorded there. And uh, it's, it was incredible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, we were. I, you know. I remember that it reminds me of a time I was in uh, Los Angeles working at the record plant, and uh, yep. I was doing Voivod, um, uh, the legendary Montreal uh, metal band, and I did a record with them. And in one room was Prince, mm -hmm. in another room was Steve Perry, and in another room was Seal. Wow, and and we had this uh, the, the kitchen area, you know, it was a huge mm -hmm. kitchen area. And it'd be, you know, big table you sit down at, and a pool, you know, thing like that, and you know, yeah, you just walk out. Hey, Prince, how you doing? And, it's like, you know, and you're listening to all the music that they're doing, you know. And, and you're hearing it before anybody else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So then you ventured over to another studio, didn't you, mm -hmm. with Sir Who? <laughs> Sir George. So Sir I got George, a job at Air Studios, Sir George uh, Martin. Sir George Martin. Yeah. And. Um, uh, basically, I was at Air Studios already, and Joyce Moore, the studio manager, came to me and said, you know, do you want a job? You know, everybody really likes you, and, you know, and I said, you know, cool, I get, I get great cigarettes and coffee, and <laughs> yeah, I, whatever, yeah. you, whatever you need, yeah. whatever you need. Yeah. So um, I, uh, they gave me a job, and I was, I was making uh, 35 pounds a week at the time. Okay. And I rented a room in Ridgemont Gardens you know, off of Russell Square. And um, and I got a job at Air Studios, and Sir George was my boss, you know. And so they stuck me with all these sessions. I was just kind of moving around, and you know, I was uh, uh, cleaning the floors, uh, rolling up the mic cables, putting the mics away, um, emptying ashtrays. Uh, and then they stuck me with Sir George um, on uh, the "Live and Let Die" soundtrack. With Paul yes, McCartney. To Paul McCartney, and of course the James Bond. Yep. Yep. So, uh, so I was like, you know, an assistant on that. So it's like, here's a 63 piece orchestra and Paul McCartney and, and, uh, Linda just walking around mm -hmm. and the band, the band wings is playing <laughs> and you yeah. and you're like, Holy shit, this is cool. You know? And Sir George and you got Jeff Emmerich as the engineer, you know, uh, the legendary, uh, engineer. And, um, and I'm just sitting in the back, taking it all in. And that's, uh, that's how I learned. And then they kind of started assigning me to sessions. And that's how I met. Uh, they would stick me with a lot of the American acts that came through. Right. Um, uh, so uh, one of the acts was Carly Sondheim. And, um, and they were recording the, uh, uh, the No Secrets album. And, uh, and I was an assistant on that. And, uh, you know, I sat down behind it. This is like my first chance to sit down behind the board and actually, you know, drive the car you know so how how did that uh, feel I and mean, how was that after all that you've studied and you know and bi-coastal and 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 you know all that stuff and now it's like this is this is the real deal it, it was yeah you're right it was the real deal 
you know, it's like you're sitting there and you got Richard Perry over your shoulder. Uh, you've got uh, uh, the arranger over your shoulder. You got the band behind your back, you know, and uh, and you're doing your you're trying to record it the best you can and mm -hmm. and go out and then we had a brilliant engineer, Robin Jeffrey Cable, uh, was an he was a legendary engineer from um, Trident Studios mm -hmm. and he came over um, and he worked on that record. So he was like my my mentor on that record. And it's like wow, you know, you know, these are like guys with great ears. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that was is that was that I was Carly's first album, wasn't it? Uh, no, that wasn't her first album. No, uh, I think those are like her, her second or third album. But it was her first big hit. And big hit, yeah. It contained uh, the um, the big hit "You're So Vain." You're so vain. Which, um, which was a monster, you know, three time Grammy winner. Um, just got nominated. Uh, just got voted in as one of the top 500 songs of all yes. time. Yes, yes, it did. Rolling Stone magazine. Yes, it did. So, um, you know, so I, I, I went to Richard Perry and I said, you know, hey, you know, Richard, am I going to get a, you know, put my name on it? You know, he goes, yeah, of course I'm going to put your name little, on little it. Little credit, know? little credit. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, yeah, you worked on it, you know, and and, um, and that was the very first credit of, of my career. Um, and then I, uh, I worked at Air Force with another, uh, 14, 16 months, 15 months, and um, and then I started. I had, I had immigration problems because I was just an assistant. Uh, you know, anyone could have done it, right? And, uh, and then I came back to New York and uh, well, I pounded. Uh, yeah. Before we do that, let's go down memory lane if we can. Sure. And we're gonna play that song, which is amazingly pushing 50 years, 1972 or three. Yeah. yeah. This is. Carly Simon, you're so vain. Hammered beyond belief, just like out of control. You know, it's funny. I had Alvin Taylor on last week, and um, uh -huh. he's a, an amazing drummer. And he started out about as young as you. He was 14, 15 years old, was playing in um, Palm Springs, replacing a drunk drummer. He was filling in for a drunk drummer, and in walks <laughs> Little Richard and Frank Sinatra. All right. And the rest is All history. Right. Yeah. So wow. check out that show, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so then you, you, uh, man, you were, didn't you work on some other stuff uh, in England or did you yeah, just Yeah, I, I did cross like uh, uh, the Live and the Die thing. And yes. then uh, uh, we did Procol Harum, Grand Hotel. I uh, worked with a, a brilliant producer, uh, uh, Chris Thomas, um, and, uh, and a, a, an amazing engineer named Bill Price, who's sadly no longer with us, but mm -hmm. uh, had great, you know, these are people that had great ears. You know, it's like you learn a lot from these guys. You know, uh, just hanging out in the back, uh, and all I was doing was getting coffee and, and and tea, and you know, running down for cigarettes, and uh, you know, that's how I started. Yeah, but you know, you, you were you were soaking it all in as an observer, and actually had you know gone to school and knew a little bit, so it uh, yeah. it pay, it obviously paid off big yeah but you know it's like in the business we're in you know you got to get behind the wheel and drive the car mm -hmm. it's, as, it's as simple as that you know so for me to say you know for bill price to say mark can you do this overdub for me I, i'm gonna go you know I, I gotta go speak to george you know okay you know and they throw you right in the seat right right away it's like you're driving the car immediately you know that's awesome we well, can't steer a parked car you got to get in it and yeah, push the pedals man. turn the absolutely. knobs <laughs> absolutely so we did that, and then Procol Harum, I did an OC Bisa record. Uh, I did um, Electric Light Orchestra, the Rollover Beethoven record. ELO, oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which was an incredible, you know, thing. It's like, you know, that the, the way they got the drums on was that Bev Bevan played the drums again. So they recorded the drums, and then they said, okay, play the drums again on top of the drums you just recorded. And I'm going... <laughs> What are you doing? I, you know? So it was like but a quasi. Has, it was a quasi overdub. Yeah, it was. But it, yeah, it was an overdub. But it was on top of the exact of the exact same track that he just laid down, and and it's like you're going. Wait a minute! Didn't he just play the drums? And, but when they played it back, it's like you go, "Holy shit! That sounds amazing!" You know. I know George and the Beatles explain uh, experimented a lot with that stuff um, yeah. back in the day. So that makes sense. Absolutely. But Absolutely, you know, yeah. it's that's always something new. Yep. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So then you and then you left and uh, came back to the states. 
came back to the States, uh, had immigration problems um, ah. with regards to what I could do. You know, it was a, basically I was just an assistant, you know, you know, uh, which any British kid could do. So I said, OK. And I got a letter of recommendation from Dave Harris, who was the, uh, the chief technical engineer at Air Studios. And, and I came back to New York and I found it on doors and I said, hey. I'm Mark Ferry. I just work with George Martin. <laughs> and, I mean, what and, more do you uh, need? What more do you need? <laughs> yeah, what more do you need? Right? <laughs> so, and then I got a job with um, uh, literally the luckiest kid in the world. I got a job with Vanguard Records, um, which was a legendary uh, jazz, folk, classical, um, country, I mean, rock, you name it. They had it on the label. They wow. Were, they were like a record label, you know? And um, and I started out just doing tape copies um, in their library because they, they they were licensing their catalog all over the world. Right? Yeah. So and back in the day, the only way you could do it was actually make a reel to reel copy of the actual master. So that was my gig. I was like, you know, stuck in a tape copy room, just making tape copies for all the international licensees. And then um, I started uh, 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 working on sessions uh, that they were recording for late for artists that were actually signed to Vanguard. Uh -huh. uh, Vanguard had a, yeah. st uh, the Vanguard studio was at uh, 208 West 23rd Street, and the offices were at 71 West 23rd Street. So we, we had to walk a block to go to the studio. Mm -hmm. And it was the uh, ballroom for the Carteret Hotel, and uh, which turned into like a, a, a condo unit, uh, not a condo, just like an, uh, apartments, you know, like an apartment building. And uh, they took over the, the that rooms uh, is a huge room banquet hall so they could record you know vanguard had a huge classical catalog as well uh, so they recorded a lot of the classical uh records over there and then i started uh uh i was getting is right when the dance music scene was was taking off uh in your know, 76 77 disco was like right, like disco yep just just starting to take off and we had a an A&R guy named Danny Weiss at the label, and Danny was uh, had more of a jazz background, so he was doing like uh, jazz funk uh, recordings. Okay. Um, like the uh, we had a band called the Players Association, which was let's say the, all the top session players of New York came together and they made a record of of, of other songs. You know, they 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 do like a, a jazz instrumental funk version of let's say Love Hangover by Diana Ross, and um, and it was huge. It did really really well. So I started engineering a lot of those dance, uh, disco dance records. And then uh, that was when 12 inches were just exploding. So, you know, they, they put your name on the 12 inch, right? And uh, so I got quite the name as a dance um, remixer and uh, doing a lot, a lot of recording. Um, and had many, many, uh, like, you know, I used to go to uh, Maynard and I would, uh, on the Billboard dance chart, I would highlight the records because I wanted to produce, really. Yeah. Right? So yep. I went to Maine because I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm, you know, I'm hanging out with George Martin and Bill Price and da da da, and I'm saying, hey, I can do this, you know? And uh, at one time, I had, uh, uh, I, I would highlight the, the records that I had on the Billboard uh, Hot 100 dance. And at one point, I had 10% of the chart. Oh my God. 10 gosh. songs that oh my gosh. had my name on it, right? As I was either engineering, I produced it, right. whatever, I mixed yeah, but you, it. You were involved in those uh, projects. Yeah, but I had, but I had something, you know, something else. So I would slide it under Maynard's door and, uh, you know, Maynard would say, you know, what the fuck is this? You know, uh, what do you want? I said, Maynard, I got, I got 10% of the chart. Like people are coming to the studio to work with me. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I want to, I want to produce. And he said, no, 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 you're a good engineer. Just, you know, just keep engineering and mixing and stuff, you know, because basically I was bringing in so much uh, 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 clients from the outside at this internal recording studio for Vanguard Records. Yeah, that it wasn't costing them a dime to have me around. Right? It was just oh, uh, you you were definitely justifying your existence. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, big time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So people were coming there, and then uh, and then we met uh, um, Eddie O'Loughlin, who had a label called Next Plateau, and uh, we did a record. Uh, I specialize in love. It makes me feel like by uh, Sharon Brown. Okay. And that record took off. And Eddie was working with a producer keyboard player named John Roby, who was working with a fellow 
kid from Massachusetts named Arthur Baker. And uh, John came down to do overdubs on these dance recordings that I was doing for Eddie. Um, and um, he, uh, he loved working with me. He loved hanging out at the studio. You know, it was like this big, Vanguard was like this big cavernous recording studio. You know, it was a ballroom to a, to a hotel. Yeah, you know that they converted into a studio. Yeah. So uh, I did that, and then Arthur Baker uh, came down, and we kind of hit it off. We were both from Massachusetts, out from Northampton. He was from Boston, kind of hit it off, and then um, and then he brought in all his urban and early hip hop projects. So I did all the Africa Bambata records, Soul Sonic Force, um, Planet Patrol, uh, Awesome Foursome, um, like big big urban, the start of urban. Um, uh, music, right? So uh, I engineered and or mixed a lot of the recordings, um, and uh, it started a whole new thing. I, I worked there for I worked at Vanguard for like uh, almost twelve years. Yeah, almost twelve yep. years. Yeah, you know, and um, and it was great. It was a tremendous experience. Maynard Solomon and his brother Seymour. Seymour ran the classical division. Maynard won the uh, ran the um, uh, the pop and the. Uh, 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 he didn't have too much to do with the urban or the dance stuff. Dan Danny Weiss kind of did all the dance stuff. Um, and then, you know, they they promoted their record. They sold tons of 12 inches uh, for records. And uh, I, did, I did this uh, project called Pouze with a jazz drummer named Alphonse Mazan, uh, who was in uh, Larry Coriel's 11th House. And Larry wow. Coriel is an artist signed to Vanguard. Wow. And, uh, and that was called Pouze. And um, it... Um, it was a huge record, just a huge, huge record, dance record. And, um, and it was, we set up the recording so that it was, so you didn't have to take the needle off. The entire side of the record was two songs, which I took, I made a loop, uh, a tape going through a tape machine, a drum, yeah. just a boom, yeah. boom, boom. Yeah. And, uh, and we, you know, we recorded for 15 minutes of boom, boom, boom. And then, you know, we made music, we made a song around the, the bass drum boom 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 it was a big big record yeah. there you know you never never know how much boom 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 was made from that one <laughs> and it's actually it's actually a, a, a drum that i went to studio 54 one night and i heard this record on the speaker and i went oh my god that foot is killing me right oh no and i went up to, oh. went up to the dj i said what record is that and they go oh, it's a band called beautiful bends you know like, beautiful Bend. okay it was boris midney a european russian um uh, musician, more like a jingle guy, made this record called Beautiful Ben, and I, and I stole it. I stole the the the, the middle eight drum loop, which is boom, boom, boom. And I took that and I looped it on tape, and that was like our bass drum for the record. Well, there you go. How awesome! I, I remember telling Maynard that I took it off another record. He like almost friggin' died. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I yeah, I, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> Are we going to get sued? What are you talking about? You sold 800,000 12 inch. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's just, right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it's just a couple. <laughs> okay. And then you, then you, uh, th then you made it over to Polygram. Yeah. And then, um, okay. So I left Vanguard or not. I actually want to still at Vanguard in 85. Uh, my lawyer, uh, a guy named Paul Schindler, still my lawyer to this yeah, day. Yeah. Paul had hooked me up with uh, Michael Gadinsky, and I had gone to Australia in early 85. Right. Okay. Australia. Uh, well, I went was still at Vanguard. Down. I went to Maynard and said, Maynard, you know, we want me to produce and make a record. You know? And he went, great. Can you bring it into the studio? I said, no, they want me to go there. <laughs> so, uh, so, no, you can't get the 80 grand for the, uh, for the recording budget. Uh, but he was very supportive. You know, Maynard was a big supporter of me. He's a hard, tough guy. Really tough guy, but uh, gave me a lot of lot of cool breaks uh, in the business. Well, it sounds and, like he was, uh, he was, he was tough, but to tough but fair. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely very tough. Yeah, but uh, I went over there and uh, and I made a record for Michael Gadinsky, who ran um, Mushroom Music, which is a legendary uh, Australian record label. And um, I went over there and, and made this record, and, and it was huge. It was called uh, The Kids in the Kitchen, and the album was called Shine. Um, and the big hit was called Current Stand. And uh, it did really well. And then we licensed it to, um, brought it back. I played it for Seymour Stein at Sire Records, and he picked it up for North America. And um, 
and it was it didn't do that well in um, in America, but internationally it did really really well. Um, and that kind of opened the door in Australia because when you went down to Australia, um, all the labels would find out about you being there. So you go down to make one record for Michael, right? And then this guy would call you from it, EMI. Word would and get then around. This guy would call you yeah. from Columbia. So oh, why are you here? You know, we, you, you <laughs> mixed this record for us. Why are you here? You know. And so I, I called Paul. I said, you know, Paul, I've got a, you know, I've got a moral ethical issue going on here. You know, he said, no, just tell Michael and, you know, but, you know, make sure they, they contribute towards your hotel and per diems. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll cut the deal with the record label for your fee. And, and that's how, that's how we did it. And cool. I kept that's going awesome. back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, I did the uh, pseudo echo, uh, love and adventure album, which had um, the country town record. And uh, I brought that back and we got it signed with Bob Buziak at RCA records. So he picked that record up, which did really, really well internationally. Um, and then um, I was just doing a lot of legendary Australian acts. Jimmy Barnes, who's like a legendary, um, like the Bruce Springsteen of Australia, and uh, James Rain from Australian Crawl, uh, great, great, great act. And uh, yeah, so I just kept going um, back and forth and back and forth. And so I, I ultimately I, I sat down with Maynard and just said, you know, I'm, I'm you know, it's starting to happen as a producer internationally. And uh, and he wished me luck, and then he, he would always call me back and you know, hey, can you help us with the library and sort these? You know, you did these records, and what's in this? You know, is this a master? Is this a demo? Is this a? So I go back, and we kind of go through the library once in a while, um, and because uh, they would like do like a lot of reissues uh, and stuff as well. You know, they they were classic at uh, the best of the very best of <laughs> the very 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 best of. Yeah. <laughs> But Maynard made a made her could milk milk a cow and make money. You know? so. yeah, the, and the jet setter that you are and were at the time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I did that. Uh, went down to Australia uh, many, many times, um, and then uh, I was off on my own. I was off doing uh, remixes, and uh, I met Jerome Gasper at uh, Polygram, and uh, he was head of the urban department. Um, and he liked what I did uh, with some of the dance, urban dance records at Vanguard. Um, I had a big hit with a girl at Vanguard called Alicia. She was 15 years old. Right. And um, <clears throat> we had a huge those are, worldwide I, I, I checked out those songs. are just a little long for the show. But they were, they were yeah, I, the, I could see, see the influence. And uh, yeah. those were fabulous songs. Yeah, they, they, were, they were big yeah, international huge. records. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, uh, Alicia, I... Uh, I actually discovered Alicia and got her into the studio. And, you know, that was one of the first productions I did with that Maynard, you know, actually paid me, you know, he said, here's, here's, here's $2,500, you know, just, if you lose this money, you're paying me back. It's coming out of your salary. You know? So I, I, you know, thankfully they were hit records. So, so the first one we did was all night passion. And then we did uh two turned on. Yeah. That was big. And then I was in England mixing, um, uh, mixing a record, and I was uh, uh, Paul McCartney was inside the room that we were going to be working in, and um, and he was recording the uh, "Give My Regards to Broad Street" uh, album, and um, people outside the studio would hand him recordings because they knew Paul McCartney was at Air Studio. So people, you know, musicians. Right. Who didn't have signed deals? You know, right. Here, here's Paul. Here's, can you listen to here's my, my music? Here's my yeah. Here's yeah. my music. Yeah. You know, can you listen to my tape? Can you, here's I, I made a forty five. Can you listen? You know. So as I'm waiting for the changeover in the studio, I'm going, "What are these?" You know, there's like a big pile of <laughs> yeah, a big stack. And he goes, "Oh, those are like demos that people give." You know, and I found a song of a reggae song uh, called uh, "Baby Talk," and uh, it was written by uh, an African Nigerian guy. Uh, named Greg Edwards, and um, I took it back to America, and I played it for Maynard, and I said, I want this to be the next single for Alicia, and Maynard was like, it's a reggae song, what are you, like, what are you going to do, reggae now? And I, no, no, man, man. yeah, like, I'm going to make a dance, you got to, like, understand what I'm, what I'm doing, here, you know, so he said, okay, do a demo, so I did a demo, and, and he got it, and, uh, and it was like a, a, a massive international smash for alicia your ear must be amazing 
<laughs> well, thankfully, I got good ears. <clears throat> thankfully, they still work, right? So when did you, and then you, then you get to polygraph, and then when did you get involved with, with all the rock and roll of the 80s? So that was around 85, 86. Okay, the mid-80s. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, mid-80s. I started getting calls. Uh, uh, I was doing major label stuff, remixes, and that's when um, all the major labels started coming after me for, to do dance remixes um, uh, for their, their, their superstar products, so. For me, it was great. I mean, I was, you know, working with some Bowie and Duran Duran and Yes and Boy George and Billy Idol and Cool and the Gang and Cameo and it was just like one after another after another. After yeah, the another, the, the, li the list is long here. Uh, David Bowie, Duran Duran, Yes, Boy George, Billy Idol, Cool and the Gang, Cameo, Carly Simon, of course, Joan Jett, just for just for starters, just for starters, yeah. as you know. Yeah, I did the Cherry Bomb record, and then and oh then she wow. Liked that. She liked that so much. I uh, I produced uh, the good music record. I did uh, like three or four songs on the good music album. Um, yeah, yeah. She's good people. We still hang out together, actually. Right now, so. <laughs> sure you do. So, um, how was it with Duran Duran? Because I I had a show twelve years ago of a lady that was really uh, hanging out with them, and she told me some great stories about which I'm trying to remember um, of Duran yeah. Duran. And those guys were obviously huge, and they had a great sound. They had a tremendous sound, and the musical genius of that band is John Taylor. Okay. He's the guy with the ear um, and, and knows what it's going to, supposed to sound like. You know, thankfully, when I did a lot of these mixes for these guys, you know, they kind of left me alone. Um, some of them I'd go, you know, what are you looking for? You know, what do you, you know, what do you hear? You know, and like with Bowie, it was like, Mark, do what you do. You know, just like, that's what you're here. Do what you do. Right? So that's a duenna, do what I did, and they liked it, so. Um, so that's what I, that was how I approached all these records. I just did what I thought was going to work in the clubs and on the dance floor. And um, well, I I think we should, if you want, we can take a little dip and listen to the El Meet El Presidente from uh, Duran Duran. Cool, cool, great mix.
wow, I guess my music guy really shut comes cut him short. But anyway, um, that's a great song. I'm not too familiar with that one. Didn't make the greatest hits <laughs> album. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, you know, listening to it, it's, it's like a like a choreographed dance. All those yes. delays going on. It's like da 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 da. Yeah, you know, I was like, I was Mr. Delay back then. And we had a good, that keyboard, that uh, that percussionist was a, a fantastic percussionist, still with us today, named Sherry Johnson, um, legendary uh, studio percussionist around New York. And uh, he did all the percussion stuff on that. Yeah, well, the percussion, no, that, that was the Duran Duran percussions the were insane. They always were amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So. so how was it working in that album? Was that Did you do anything more with them, or was that pretty much? Yeah, I also worked on, uh, it was on the Notorious Notorious, album. oh, man. Yeah, so I did. I worked on Notorious as well. That's a great album. So um, that, that's a remix that's out, too, uh, somewhere. I gotta you got to dig it up, you know. Yeah. So then you were only with Polygram for four and a half years and you decided to head to Toronto. Well, I was doing a, like a lot of the international remixing from the UK and um, and still in Australia, going back and forth to Australia uh, as well. Uh, and then, yeah, I, um, I wound up in Toronto again. It came down to Paul. Paul represented a uh, Canadian, the management company for a Canadian rock band called Platinum Blonde. And they were like... Uh, kind of like the Bon Jovi of Canada, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I did a record with the bass player, Kenny McLean, um, and I won a Juno award. So um, so I got plugged into that, and we did a really cool record together. Uh, and then I just started coming in demand as a producer. For me, it was like, it was great, you know, because that friggin' flight to Australia killed me. Killed me. It can be brutal, with, let alone the, the, brutal, the time man. change. Brutal. Yeah, so, what time zone am I in? Yeah, so for for Toronto, it was like you know ninety minutes, you know, bang, I'm in Toronto, uh, from New York City, and you know that was back in the day when, you know, the the tarmac, the plane was on the tarmac, and they were actually shutting the door. It was one of the smaller aircrafts because they would fly into the, the downtown airport, and I'd, <laughs> and I'd be running out onto the hold on, hold on, I'm coming. You know, they'd open the door for you. Uh, you know, but, that was back in the day. Those days are long gone. <laughs> yeah, they are. So, uh, so yeah, I was coming back and forth. And, and then I, I discovered a band uh, in Toronto called I Mother Earth. And yes. They were um, a really cool band. I, I went into a, uh, a nightclub um, one night and heard them. And, and I went, wow, these guys are like pretty special guys. And uh, so I started calling my friends. And one of my friends was Michael Olago. And Michael was an A&R guy um, at Electra, and he signed Metallica and um, uh, Megadeth and a couple of other really cool heavier rock bands. Um, and I, uh, I said, Michael, I got this thing. He says, send me a tape. I said, I don't have a tape. I, I just saw them the other night. I think they're, I think they're special. Can you, can you come up and see them? And he goes, can't you do a tape for me? Come on. You know, I said, no, no, you got to come up with me. So I actually flew to New York and went into his office at Electra, took him out of the office, took him to the airport. You kidnapped bought him. him a ticket, you kidnapped bought him a ticket. Him. And he said, what the fuck are you doing? Where are you taking me? <laughs> said, You're coming to Toronto. You're going to see this band. So oh, uh, we saw the band uh, uh, perform, and Michael, you know, bitched and moaned all the way to see the band, da 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 And I'll never forget this. He came up halfway through the set. And uh, he said, came up to my ear, and the band is like friggin' loud, whispers in my ear. He says, "Thank you, this is special." And the rest is history. They were a very cool band. Um, they just signed a huge deal. Unfortunately, they didn't sign with Electra. Uh, they signed with Capital EMI, um, and it was a joint venture between EMI Canada because you know it's just a, Canada was just a small territory in terms of record sales, right? So they needed the financial support of the American side. So um, uh, they signed uh, with Capital EMI and uh, in LA and uh, EMI Records in Canada. And they, they did they did several records and they were a really cool band. You know. So in the time left, you, AMG's gotten involved in. Uh, I see you've got some movie credits. Yeah. So we uh, AMG is now uh, uh, a company that's because it's no longer the music 
in the film and television business, it's the media business. Right. And, right. And they all and they all talk to one another. It's uh, right. It's it's all it's all inter- interconnected. Totally interconnected yeah. today. And social media. Um, social media. You know, just the fact that uh, you know, over the last two years, the pandemic alone has yes. you know, created created Changed. sixty million new subscribers to Netflix. Yes. That's on top of the one hundred forty five million they already have. So, uh, you know, if you want to keep those subscriptions at fourteen ninety nine coming in every month, then you know you better have some new programming, and all that new programming needs music. Content is and king. And it needs distribution. So, we put together a deal with a company in, in Canada called Factory Film. Uh, this was just recently, and uh, let me should back up a little. I I got a movie on on Drake. I picked up a movie. Uh, a live concert film of him coming back to uh, Toronto uh, after the Degrassi uh, show that he worked on. Yeah. And he did a show in, in Toronto. And the concert was called Homecoming. And um, they played at the Sound Academy in downtown Toronto. And it was sold out. And he was just exploding. His mixtape on the street was huge. Um, and uh, and I picked up this movie. Um on on drake and it was a it was a special movie and i cut a deal with amc uh the theater chain in america they they had a division called spectacast at the time that did this kind of like specialty programming on you know from like sunday to thursday right you know not many not many bums in the seats but you know (laughs) they get in an opera from here and you know this broadway play and you know the wrestling and the boxing and things like that so uh we did two nights we did 1400 theaters worldwide and um for us it was very successful and and I said, wow, this is cool. I like this movie business stuff, you know. And now we're uh, full fledged. We have an output deal, distribution deal, with Factory Film here in Canada. Fabulous. It also Fabulous. embodies uh, co-financing scenarios for film projects. So um, we service 150 DSPs worldwide, digital service providers. Um, we do uh, in-flight entertainment, uh, the World's Airlines. We do hotel VOD. And we're just now getting uh, amassing our catalog. Um, uh, we picked up uh, a, a film, um, a documentary film on uh, one of our first projects coming out will be uh, on, on the death of Nicole Simpson, which is an alternative theory on the, on the, the murder. Ah, uh, yes, in Bermuda. Uh, yeah, <laughs> remember, remember, yeah, remember that. So, uh, yeah. so that's uh, that we just picked that documentary up, and that's like a, a two-hour film. Uh, we got that, and we're. We're chasing a um, chasing a really cool project on the legendary um, DJ Larry Levan from uh, the Garage nightclub, uh, Paradise Garage in New York City, and um, I worked with Larry a few times on a couple of records. Um, so it's a documentary that I'd like to pick up and get it out because uh, I think people should really see what Larry did Absolute. and what Larry's contribution Absolutely. was to the to the, uh, to the business. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a, you know, we're picking up, uh, uh, all kinds of cool projects and films and television programs. And, you know, of course, where we can insert music from our clients, uh, we, we put that music in the film and TV as well. So. Lastly, since we're probably out of time, I wanted to touch on the book that's coming out, it, uh, the working title, if it's actually titled, which I think is an incredible title, Risking Nothing Would Be Way Too Risky For Me. That's correct. So uh, the whole thing's been a one big risk, but it's all paid off. Um, and I just followed my dreams. I just fo- I just stayed on course. And uh, you know, you you get kicked, and you get kicked, and you get kicked. But you just gotta keep getting up the course. You it's know, and back up. And, that, and that's what I did. I just uh, you know, um, I just stayed the course. You know. Well, but yeah, so that should be out sometime next year. Next year, um, oh, next year, okay. Next year, yeah, awesome. we're looking at it for next year. Okay. And then uh, I, I'm I'm putting all that together uh, right now and talking into a recorder and the author's giving me prompts and you know what happened here, what happened there, and I just got to talk into a recorder. I send it over to him, and he puts it in uh, in a form that makes me sound like a genius. Well, I don't think I think you think you not only sound like a genius, but you sound like a genius. <laughs> 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 so mark it's been a thrill i mean thanks so much i was a huge fan i was around in the in the 80s and the music of all those guys and everything and thank you, know you so much for 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 doing that i mean it was just an incredible journey and a blast and 
Um, I'm hoping for more of the same that's coming out now. I don't, I don't know about the music that's coming out now these days, but we need to improve stuff and bring back the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> How can so, folks... Well, thank you very, thank you very Mark, much for Thank you me. so much. How do we get a hold of you if uh, someone wants to learn more about uh, what, okay, what's so, going on? Uh, so AMG is at the AMG Corp, T-H-E-A-M-G-C-O-R-P dot com. And uh, I'm Mark at the AMG Corp dot com. Feel free to email me. I'm very approachable uh, on all levels <laughs> in music, film, television, um, you know, uh, to get things uh, up and running and get it out. You know, most important, you know, we've got this we've got this massive, great distribution system worldwide with all these streaming networks and TV and da da da. It's like, you know. Let's get it out. From one of our discussions you mentioned, I will chat to you at another time. I'm working on a project that you might be interested in in terms of your uh, digital distribution. So Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. more the merrier. Definitely help you out. Well, Definitely thanks, Mark. I you know out. you will. Thanks for being on the show. And um, that's it. Folks, you've tuned in to On Air with Walt, and you can find me on onairwithwalt.com. We are on every single um, platform that uh, podcasting is, including iHeartRadio. And, of course, I hear a UBN geo.com united broadcasting network and you can find us here every thursday at 6 p.m pacific and mark have a great night thanks a million and uh thanks we're out talk to you soon thanks walt thanks take mark. care buddy bye-bye